First of all, thanks to Kamau for hosting the event, and well, second to Jan for um, accepting me inviting myself to the meetup. <laughs> 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 so yeah, um, I'm Sebastian. Um, basically, people on the internet know me as ASCII Disco on Twitter, on GitHub, well, I'm basically everywhere. So if you see ASCII Disco on the web, that is probably me. Um, and it's, it's quite, well, <laughs> an interesting thing. So I, I do live in Cologne, but for the past 70 years, with the exception of one year, I've been working here in Darmstadt, just like, I don't know, 10 minute walk away at Deutsche Telekom. So uh, I do live in Cologne, but two or three days a week, I'm here in Darmstadt, and I'm doing that, as I said, for the past seven years. Uh, still, I never was able to attend any meetup here in Darmstadt or you know, speak at one. So um, then heads up for Darmstadt.js because we'll be there with uh, a gang from work next Tuesday as well. Um, yeah, so you see that I've brought a lot of stuff. And this is also not because only I love the web. I started out as a web developer like 13. 14 years nearly ago. Um, but in the project at Deutsche Telekom, I do work with things. Mm. People like to call them smart things. I know they're actually quite dumb. So I, let's, let's stick to connected things. And I do work at uh, Deutsche Telekom at their smart home solution, doing all weird stuff with Node and Python and a bit of rust recently, but I always have like this true deep love, like for my first love, the web. So um, HTML. Yay. I've been tinkering with hardware since 2011. So I've been doing this professionally since 2011 when I started working at the Smart Home project. But I do a lot of side projects and have done a lot of side projects. That's actually like the one of the tables in my home office where all of these devices can be connected wirelessly and I do have about 150 or so at home. So my local network is getting really short of IPv4 addresses. Um, but yeah, the thing is, I've been tinkering with those things since 2011, like seven, eight years. But I do have no background in electrical engineering um, that is also why one day, I think five years ago, uh, this thing here made me end up in an ambulance here in Darmstadt. Quick hint, like security advice. Never take off the shelf of a device while it's connected to a power socket. <laughs> because maybe, maybe the manufacturer found it interesting to put a metal plate that is undercurrent, like directly beneath the shelf. Um, yeah. Well, I survived, and tinkering with hardware is fun. Um, usually, I, since then, I try to stick with things that only do drizzle a bit, like 12 volts or something like that. <laughs> but yeah, as I said, I have no background in electrical engineering, and the thing is, you don't need to have a background in electrical engineering to do all lovely things. And this is also due to the power of the universal hardware interface, like the most universal hardware interface that we have, and that is USB. It's like one protocol to rule them all. And um, I mean, you can connect anything with USB. It might be those fancy rocket launchers, your cell phone, wireless networks like Bluetooth and Zigbee. And basically, if it is connectable and not wireless, it is basically connectable via USB or serial port, which can be, well, also proxy by USB, or be integrated into USB. Before we dive deeper into the topic of web USB and do stuff with those things here, um, let me talk to you a bit about the USB basics. And I always like to start with the history of things, when I, when I personally approach things. Because in the beginning, I often find things easier to understand. Because if 
a protocol specification has evolved to version 3.2 over 15 years, it's really hard to get into the topic. So also one of the things I often do is when I approach web or JavaScript projects on GitHub or stuff like that, I'll go back to the first few commits. So it's quite, it's, it, I found it way more intuitive to see how things have grown uh, than to understand a big pile of whatever. So let's talk a bit about history of USB. And it all started in 1994. A group of technicians and um, computer scientists from various companies led by Intel um, formed a working group to end the adapter madness that we had back in the day. I don't know if you did like computer stuff in the 90s, but you had like PS2 ports to connect mouse and uh, the mouse and, and the keyboard, and you had serial ports, and you had parallel ports for printers and things like this. You had SCSI for external storage media, etc. So to bring an end to all of this madness, this group set out to and created USB. Well, in 1995 then, the first USB mainboard and uh, PCI cards that had a USB host controller became available. Thing is, there were no devices out there back then, like nearly zero. And USB had like, really like a, a rough start. It wasn't really adapted by people. <coughs> Until 1998, when Apple decided to brave once, uh, decided to be brave one, once and to remove basically everything from their new iMac but USB. So uh, the outcry was enormous back then, like a lot when, when they got rid of the um, headphone jack these days. It's like, yeah, you, you can have an external floppy disk and it's connectable via USB and there was basically only one out there from Apple. It was, it was interesting. But I think that was, that was like the turning point. Since then, USB became popular, like really popular. And in 2000, there was like the second version of the spec, USB 2.0. But what was way more interesting, the first USB flash drive, first external storage by USB became available. I don't know if you ever, well, when I was a kid, I did really enjoy watching Computer Club on uh, WDR. And I can still remember when they had shown like the first USB storage unit with a whopping capacity of eight megabytes and that cost around 250 mark, because Euro wasn't a thing like that. But yeah, that was like, I mean, every one of us probably at one point in our lives owned the USB flash drive. And the first one is only around for 19 years. So that is, in my, in my opinion, very interesting. Oh well, yeah, years passed by, 2008, we have USB 3.0, uh, that was USB SS super speed that brought additions to the spec and um, trying to get USB up to speed so that it can that it can keep up with modern devices. Interestingly, it nearly took I don't know twelve or thirteen years. Uh, no, sorry, like six or seven years for a lot of devices and device vendors to pick that up and well bring USB 3.0 devices to people's homes. Yeah. I said, no background in electrical engineering. So I tried to keep things as simple, <laughs> especially for myself. So if you were to like cut through USB wire, you would find four cables, or well, four connectors, and in a USB plug, like in the actual plug, you find four connectable pins. Um, one is for power, because USB was um, like not back in the day, not like serial ports or parallel ports, USB could also deliver like a power, a current, to the device itself, up to five volts. So one of those cables, one of those pins is for that. And also, if you have what with power, you have to have a ground pin. Interesting thing, then, is two wires are for sending the data, sending and receiving the data as it's bidirectional. 
At first I thought, like when I was, when I was looking into the spec, oh, that makes a lot of sense. It's like probably D plus is there for sending data up the wire and D minus for the other way around. But no, um, basically the same data in both directions is sent over both cables at the same time. It is some safety mechanism, some fallback mechanism, as well as, well, security mechanism, because you can like, check if the data is the same on both wires. So theoretically, I don't know if many devices uh, do that, but theoretically, you can. But uh, the thing with USB devices in general that is like really annoying is, I don't know, I, I recently, like last year, got a printer, and I actually, the, the first failure I did was like I wanted to connect the printer to a Linux box at home. <coughs> Never do that because printers and Linux just don't work. But yeah, the, the usual way when you when you bring home a new device is, well, you search for a driver like on in the internet, and well, when you find something, then you probably install some native application that has lots of stock images in it and says, yeah, your, your device should be ready now. Um, but then you think, well, uh, but it doesn't work. The printer doesn't actually do print anything. Is that device like not supported on my latest Mac OS X or whatever? And then you, 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 you kind of like repeat that and, and search up for, search for another driver and then Maybe later on, some scary pop-up from your operating system turns up, which says, yeah, you know, you're going to install a driver, and that can, um, pardon me, fuck up your whole system. And, well, often that happens, and then your old printer doesn't work anymore as well, mm -hmm. and a new one still doesn't. And then you try to get rid of all that native code, and. It's, it just sticks around forever. There's no way of getting rid of it like, without diving deep into operating system files and folders and manually like scratching out the bits. This is, no. Nah. So, USB was advertised as plug and play. So, isn't there like, an, like a nice USB way, a nicer way to interact with USB, which could work like this. Like, you buy a device, you just plug it in, and then some notification appears that says, hey, congratulations, you plugged in your new device. Then you just click on that notification like you're used to from smartphone, because we're all used to notifications these days. And, and that just opens a website. And when you want to print something, for example, you just drag and drop a file onto that website, and the printer prints. Well, wouldn't that be fun? Thing is, other people thought, yeah, that would be fun and that would be a really good way to interact with USB. So, a team at Chrome, uh, a team at Google, uh, in, in, uh, who's working on Chrome, came up with WebUSB, which does essentially that. A few facts about WebUSB. Like all the new and shiny tech that we have that has some security constraint, constraints like the location API or the web Bluetooth API, etc. It's only available via HTTPS or, of course, on your local development machine. Local development machine if you <coughs> work on localhost. If you want to have that feature on an HTTP only site, doesn't work. No chance. There is no additional native code needed. So, any device you have, you either have to write your own driver or you get a driver that is written in JavaScript. So there's no driver you need to install. It's just your browser and some JavaScript. And as I said, it's, just, it, it's real plug and play because you plug it in and the device can announce itself and say, yeah, click on that notification and it opens the website. We'll see that later. And well, that is essentially how USB was designed in the first place, being plug plug and play, uh, I think even with USB, they really introduced that term into um, the operating system. Okay, I know there are quite a few developers probably in here, and you want to see some code, that's, um, I'll get rid of that university style lectures and get to the meat. Let's take a look at the code that is needed to get the device up and running. 
So, um, warning in the beginning, the USB APIs, as they are around since 95, um, they are not really web-ish. So if you're used to web development, it is kind of like different. So, uh, but don't be scared. It, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not that complicated. But I just wanted to say, it's those APIs, even if they're implemented in JavaScript and pretty new, they're not very web-ish. So, we, well, hang on, or tang along at the USB specification itself while getting through that code. Because we need to understand a bit of how USB works and how you interact with the bus system and the protocol to get a few devices up and running. Um, it all starts with connecting to the device, and with that I mean the device descriptor. There is typically only one descriptor, one device descriptor per device you plug in, and that provides some information about the product, for example, product name, or about the manufacturer, and that is common and standard for all USB devices. So even if your device is 15, year, 15 years old, so um, way before web USB was introduced, because it needs to comply to the USB spec, it can announce itself by its name and by its manufacturer. And, well, one of the interesting things when you use the Navigator USB request device endpoint, the API that is built into the browser, which is basically your entry, entry point into talking to USB devices, you can apply filters that say only devices from that vendor are allowed, only devices that uh, have that product name or that product ID. There, there's a bunch of filter criteria that you can use. Um, we'll see later why that is important, but please keep in mind, yes, the request device thingy can take a filter box. Um, yeah, and once we selected a device, we only have to, divide, uh, have to call device open, which returns a promise. And with that, we then can go on and talk to the so-called config descriptors of the device. Um, well, theoretically, configuration descriptors, a device can have many of them, like up to 255, I think. Um, but usually, it only has one. And this is due to the fact that in the first Windows version that supported USB, the, w the Windows standard USB driver could only handle one config descriptor, one config endpoint, and so a lot of devices that are still being built and shipped today only have one config descriptor because of that bug in Windows 95 edition whatever. Um, with the configuration descriptors, it's actually like in the background what is happening, the device can tell um, the system, ah, I need that amount of power and I'm capable of transmitting data at that rate, etc. So that is possible thanks to the configuration. And um, you can think of configurations as APIs to the device. And you can think of having multiple configurations as API versioning. Like if you've ever seen or built a REST API that has version one slash that endpoint, version two, like the newer version of that endpoint, like version APIs, it's basically the same with those configurations. So you have one configuration endpoint that presents then this API be behind configuration endpoint, one to you, and later on, maybe in the meantime, the vendor comes up with a firmware update, but instead of breaking all the drivers out there and all the people using the device, they just introduce a second configuration endpoint with the new API that the new driver can use with the device. Um, yeah, we can then use the select configuration method to select a config descriptor, usually the first one, as said, because many devices only have one. And then we need to claim an interface on a device. Um, the same as with config descriptors. A config descriptor can have many interface descriptors, and they basically are our guides 
to a specific functionality on a device. So we need to claim one of the interfaces, which is represented by a simple number, in order to do something. For example, um, you all probably know those printers that are also a scanner and he, uh, can take memory cards, etc. Printing, the printing functionality would be behind interface zero, the scanning functionality would be behind interface one, and any further functionalities would be behind other interfaces. So it's basically like a natural separation of the functionality of the device, um, and it's available via the interface. So after we claim the interface, we then can talk to so-called endpoint descriptors. And again, an interface can have many of those, um, which is, it can be a bit confusing over time. But usually, if you're working with like, a lot of devices, you'll see that really they only have like two or three interfaces in each one or two endpoints. Um, in the end, so endpoint descriptors, they, for example, tell which transfer direction we're going, uh, we, we, we can use. So um, one endpoint, for example, just takes data, consumes, so we can push data to the device and it gets consumed. And another endpoint is therefore sending data back to us or enabling us to grab data from it. Uh, polling intervals, etc. they can be um, they can be defined by those endpoints. Well, and to communicate with those endpoints, we have three different me methods or ways available. Um, they all come in pairs. So um, one method is for sending data, that's like on the left, and one method is for um, receiving data. First thing, and one of the most commonly ones, is the so-called interrupt transfer. And the interrupt transfer is used for small, often device-initiated communication. And with small, I mean small chunks of data. So no big blocks of data, just really like small chunks. Um, you need to configure it, so you give it the endpoint you're going to talk to. In this case, endpoint one or uh, that should have been endpoint two because the same endpoint can't uh, send or receive data. And then you either have to define which data you'd like to send to the, to the device, which often is just binary encoded text. And then also, if you want to receive data, you need to tell the endpoint how much, so the length of the data in um, bytes that you want to receive. Second way is the control transfer. And the control transfers are nice for small configuration commands. They get bus priority, so no waiting. And they have a well-defined structure. So think about steering a robot arm. You would use control transfers for that. Because you could then tell the arm, like, with one command to move to the right, with one command to move to the left, and then up, up, etc. That is essentially what you would do with control transfers. Like again, just small commands you send to the device, uh, usually not that much data. They require a bit of configuration though, and I'm not getting into details now. We'll get into details later after we've seen actually some interaction with the devices. Latest ones, I'm not going to explain a lot about them. They're so-called isochronous transfers. They're usually used for um, real-time and um, persistent streams of data, like for audio and video. So if you have a video camera attached by USB, usually uses isochronous transfers. In all of the devices I've tried to steer it or try to connect via that USB. I have never encountered one that used the isochronous transfer. So if you see one in the wild, consider yourself lucky, because I haven't. Well, and <laughs> pray to the demo, but that's actually the fun bit of, of doing this talk, because you never know what's going to break today. <laughs> that's why I always bring lots of stuff, because then I can say, yeah, that was like two out of four, great. Um, 
<laughs> be proud of yourself. Uh, yeah, actually, you should actually even forgot one cable, packed the wrong bag, um, for that device. So uh, yeah, that is already out. So we still have four demos, and the first one is well, it involves the Tinkerer's dialing device number one, the Arduino. You probably have seen one, at least heard of the name Arduino, uh, as it's around for about 10 years and like the Tinkerer's platform per se. If you are doing JavaScript and interacted with the Arduino, you probably use Johnny5, which is the JavaScript or Node.js library that usually use to um, connect to microcontrollers like the Arduino. J5 is pretty cool because it created a very easy interface to um, talk to those devices. Also, they have a lot of examples on how to wire things up so that you don't break stuff and uh, <laughs> that you not get electrocuted like I did. And um, yeah, this is as, as this is already <coughs> JavaScript code, I thought, well, maybe I can use that in the browser with WebUSB without having a node server running at all. So having Join 5 running in the browser itself. So <coughs> let's quickly switch to um, mirroring because that makes things easier for me. Um, and to this example. So first I'll reload and see if I brought a camera so that it's easier for everyone to follow along. And also, said I also brought an Arduino, so let's just connect it. And you see, that is the notification I was talking about in the beginning. I just wired the Arduino app and a computer or a Chrome told me, well, you attached an Arduino Leonardo. That's well you can you can go to that domain by clicking on this notification. But as I'm already on the website, I'll just skip that. So then I need to connect to the device. Well, interesting thing is I already have because I tested it. Um, so I'm connected to my Arduino. And I thought like, great, so now that I have Johnny5 running in the browser, I could have some interactive console so that I can well, talk to the Arduino right away. So I'm using exactly the same code, well, there's the cursor, as um, they have here on the Johnny5 documentation, which is a node project, but now I'm just using that in the browser. Just need to tell that I have an LED connected to pin 13 here, and then I could say, well, let's turn the LED off, which should work if I'm not mistaken, which doesn't right now. So that is like the good thing I um, should have like have some copy and paste code because I made the mistake of, well, uh, writing LED in all caps, which isn't, I have to write it in camel case. And yeah, uh, the blink command works as you see, and let's better that way, um, because that is exactly what I wanted the Arduino to do. And now I should be able to do some things like turn it off, which takes a bit of time because um, it is, <coughs> not really optimized for the browser and what you see. You see now I've turned it off, also turn it on. And it takes a bit of time to transfer the data because I haven't opti uh, optimized the driver for what you speak, but generally it works. Um, back to the slides. Uh, and well, let's stop the syncing. That, that will make it easy, hopefully. Somewhat there. All right, so that is working. And it wasn't that hard. So because we have tools in the JavaScript space already available that allow us to run Node in the browser, things like Browserify, for example, is 
just a matter of swapping out modules with their browser counterparts. And actually, only one thing I had to write myself, well, I didn't write it entirely myself. I was working together with a couple of people who had the same goal. And so we said, OK, swap out the serial pod module in Node.js with a module that is browser and web USB compliant, browser serial pod. And then we can easily talk to serial pod devices via the browser. So you see, that is, that is this weird control transfer I was talking about like five minutes ago. And uh, let, let us try to demystify that a bit by uh, one of the Arduino examples. So um, that is all like happening in the background in that browser serial pod library. So you, as a user of Johnny5 in a browser, don't have to touch it. Um, request type. Request type um, is just one of a few perspective-defined USB standard types that you can choose from. Um, when we tank said our request type is class, then the USB driver of the operating system knows how to deal with it. And class is what we need in order to talk to serial pod enabled devices. Um, when you say, when you use the class request type, then you say, I have a device that adheres to a well-defined standard. Printers are an example for that as well. Like one of the receipt printers I have here um, does the same thing. It uses the class request type because it adheres to the printer, receipt printer standard to pass. Um, well, next thing is the recipient. And in this case, it's an interface node. It could also be an endpoint node. But as this command is like the initial, please serial port, open up. I want to communicate with you. I need to talk to the interface and not the endpoint because it's the hello serial port, please open your door for me part. Um, request is actually defines what we want to do. So in this example, it's um, hex 22 says serial port, please open the doors for us, please open up yourself for communication. Um, and along with the request, we can also send a value, so a small chunk of data to enrich in our request. Um, serial port doesn't need that, so we send hex 01, which means uh, nothing. And um, again, if you, if you come back to the example of steering a robot arm, you could probably say, OK, I've sent a request, <coughs> hex 23, whatever. And with the value, with the payload I sent, I then, in the end, determine if I move the arm left or right. When I say that request, hex 20, 23, says, OK, that is moving arms left or right. Then I could say value, hex 2 or hex 1, says left or right. So the payload of the request. And yeah, index is basically related to interface or endpoint. So that tells the uh, method to which, with which interface or which endpoint we're going to communicate. Again, as this is just a bunch of numbers, um, it's not that sophisticated. Yeah, and in the end, we can then do this, which is like using exactly the same code in the browser as we did with Node.js. I think, I mean, it's, it's nothing scary anymore. So you don't need to have to set up a framework or something to, to interact with those hardware. All, all, the, all the obstacles are gone. You just need to plug it in and use your browser. And you can have an interactive console that program that you can program along and see the results immediately. Well, next demo. And uh, for that, I thought, like, okay, what, what, what is an interesting goal or an interesting device that might do a little bit more than that an LED blink? And I thought, like, great, so I have this cheap Chinese Android tablet I bought once and never used. Um, Maybe I can use web USB to access that device. And so, quick demo. That was the, oh, that was the camera. <laughs> lots of cables, lots of chaos. It's like exactly like on my desk at home. But before I'll plug that tablet in, I'll use its 
cheap and bad camera to take a picture of you lovely people. Mm -hmm. If I'm, like, I, I really do not buy Android because it takes me ages to find anything, but okay. Lovely people of Darmstadt, say cheese. Cheese. Oh, that was that was a video recording. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Android. I'm, I'm really not an Android person. It's just a confusing user experience. Okay, again, cheese people. Smile. I hope that was a photo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure that was one. Oh, interesting. It opened up context. The contacts. Why? No idea. So yeah. The, hmm. Questions: How how can I how can I show that that picture to you? Because that using that camera here, that, that that's not that's not really cool thing to do. Maybe I could somehow download the picture by USB from the car and show it to you from within the browser. So I'm going to connect the device and um, where am I? Oh yeah, that's like. That's definitely not what I wanted to do. Let's see. Please just give me a second. Display, display. Ah, there you go. Oh, uh, let's, let's do the sync thing again. That makes me sense. OK, so second demo. Camera's up. OK, here we go. This is like the demo that is most likely to break, so Brace yourselves. <laughs> All right, I'm going to connect to the USB device. You haven't seen that with the Arduino because I was already connected to it because I tested it right before the talk. But I haven't connected the device before. I just did it and reloaded the browser. And now I have all the Android devices I have currently connected to my computer available for connection. And this is where the filter clause I was showing right in the beginning comes in because if I didn't set a filter to that device's vendor or something like that, I would just see all the USB devices connected to my computer. And that can be a lot. But as I set a filter clause to only that vendor of that Android device, I only see that tablet. OK, let's connect it. The tablet itself, because I'm using the USB debugging feature from Android, says there's a computer that wants to connect to you. And I just have to say, OK, it is allowed. So um, now I'm trying to list the files from the storage. And it seems that there is an image present. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can download that image. So pull the file directly into the browser, which, well, worked. Let's, let's open that in a new tab. Here we go. You see, camera quality is quite bad, but that was just a picture I took of you lovely people a couple of moments ago, and now it's in my browser. Magic, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, all these things you can do with computers these days. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, let's 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 dig deeper into uh, how I've done that. Um, I'm using the so-called Android Debug Bridge Protocol, ADB. So if you ever did any native development with Android, or if you try to debug websites on a mobile device, you're probably familiar with using ADB in some way. It's just a way to connect to the device and, well, get access to everything on it. <laughs> so um, in the end, it was just a matter of taking that specification and turning it into code to make it run in a browser. It is quite a complex protocol. <laughs> so that, that example here roughly illustrates how you can construct one message that, that does send one command that then gets executed on a device. I'm not going to dig deeper into that. That is probably something I would do at a hardcore JavaScript conference. And no, that is just really confusing. Instead, if you're interested, Look at what other people already built, because there's a web ADB library, which is done by people from Google. And it makes connecting to an ADB compatible device, an Android device, quite easy. So you only have to require a web library. 
you have to open an ADB connection. And well, then you can do then you can do all the great things like execute shell commands as this is just a Nix box on the Android itself, which in the end was was what I did with the example. So I did peek using the shell into the storage of that device and then <laughs> did a trick to convert on the shell that image into base64 and just transfer it as text to the browser because browsers can deal with base64 images, right? You can do anything with ADB from the browser, so shell access, uploading APKs, starting APKs, accessing all the user data, and if <laughs> accessing all the user data <laughs> did ring a bell, you might think about like, haven't those web USB people thought about security and stuff? I mean, what the heck is going on? Access all user data. Well, they have thought about security. So, first of all, if you want to connect to a USB device, if you are a website and want to connect to a USB, to a USB device, you can only do so by a user gesture. So the user has to actively click or touch or do anything really actively to allow the API to communicate with the device. So there is no, oh, you, you've just entered the website and scans all your USB devices, doesn't work. The user has to activate it actively. Also, the user has to grant permission. That was the dialogue you've seen, like select a device that was explicitly granting the website permission to access that device for now and for our future time. And <laughs> well, a slight flaw in this specification. Uh, also, um, with web USB, you cannot access cameras, like built-in cameras to your laptops. That is what the Get User Media API is for. Um, and you can't access microphones, and also you can't access USB mass storage devices like USB sticks or external hard drives. No way, that's like the API, no way to access those. And the interesting thing, it seems like, as this is only available on Chrome, it seems like the Google people do have a kill switch for web USB. <coughs> because with Chrome version, I think it was 54, that was one of the first ones where web USB was enabled, people discovered a security flaw with the YubiKey two-factor of devices. So just like USB devices that store all your keys. And then people found out that, hey, with web USB, it's actually quite easy to read out all the keys from the store of the two-factor authentication device, which is definitely not a thing you want to enable any website to do. And because that was such a major flaw, and YubiKey was the, relying on that new API for some of their stuff, Google just flipped the switch and disabled WebUSB for all of the browsers out there. So WebUSB the API wasn't available anymore, just an error in your JavaScript console. And then when they fixed the security issue, like two versions later with Chrome 56, I think, then they just flipped the switch and turned WebUSB back on. So <laughs> yeah, don't build any mission critical stuff with it yet. Um, well, up to the next demo. Um, <laughs> As, as I told you, I'm working um, in the field of smart home, and so I brought a few smart home-ish devices with me, like this light bulb and uh, this light switch, you can, this rocker, you can just like glue to your wall. And let's say, um, cool thing about, let's just disconnect, tablet, cool thing about, um, USB is that you get a lot of adapters for wireless protocols. So I have an adapter for the AnOcean protocol, which is a lovely hackable protocol because everything you do in your smart home with your AnOcean installation is sent as plain text over the air and everyone can listen. <laughs> <laughs> so it's reverse engineer's dream. Also enables things like, I don't know, scenarios I dream up with when I'm alone in my hotel room here in Darmstadt, like drive-by heatings and stuff like that at people's <laughs> homes. People's homes. So yeah, um, the other thing I brought with is a bulb that is connected via Bluetooth. And so uh, I'm going to use this rocker, this switch, 
which I can connect with this USB stick via an Ocean protocol and via USB. If I actually manage to plug it in. Uh, and this bulb, and I'm going to use the Web Bluetooth API for this bulb. This is not really like part of the talk. I just like to play around with this um, um, technology as well. If you want to have a deep dive into Web Bluetooth as well, there is a wonderful talk from my friend Niels from, for example, Dachfest. So if you look for Web Bluetooth and his name, Niels, uh, with IE, you probably find uh, 500 Web Bluetooth talks, and they're all amazing. So um, if you want to know, know more about that, Google it. Um, yeah, demo time again, which means for me, sinking the mirrors, uh, sinking the mirrors, mirroring the sinkers, no, sinking the displays. And, oh, no. So um, I probably don't need to put the camera <laughs> on. <laughs> and maybe I can, I can show you how I press the thing. So first of all, I need to connect USB. And here I have my Anocean USB device. Let's connect that. Then I have to connect the Bluetooth bulb. Oh, lots of Bluetooth devices in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I use the one that's called LED. <laughs> that should be my bulb, hopefully. And now that I have connected both devices, the APIs are very similar. I should be able, I'm holding, it, I'm holding it the right way, hopefully, should be able to turn on, should be able to, I should be able to, but it doesn't work, unfortunately. I should be able to flip the switch and have the bulb going, turning on and off, but it seems like this is going to be the demo that breaks today. There is, Nothing on the console. Well, let's, you know what? Let's just really, let's just try again. Okay. It seems like I've connected to the USB interface. Oh, and there we go. Window bulb on is not a function. So probably there is an error in my code. And, um, huh. Well, this is like really embarrassing because I've done this demo quite a few times and it always worked. So I probably just have mistaken something here, connect to Bluetooth again. Let's give it one more try. It says ready, but is it? Mm -hmm. No, no, oh. yes. yeah, you see, <laughs> it, it, it kind of works now. <laughs> There's like two edgy technologies working together. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> it's not working really reliable, but Maybe also due to the fact that I've implemented just a tiny part of the specification of the Ocean protocol with that USB, but it kind of works. Kind of. I'd say at least enough for this demo. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, anyone have a train to catch or something? Because I probably need 10 more minutes or 15. Um, connecting to an ocean is actually not that hard because I already have, like from my Arduino <coughs> example, the connection to the serial port and nearly all of those wireless um, USB connectors, like lots of Zigbee and others, um, do just use the serial port protocol. and. What I do when there's incoming data, because everything is just plain text over the app, when there's incoming data, I can do a wonderful trick to use the text encoder to make that binary turn into something string-ish, and then <laughs> use just like plain string methods to find, what is hap find out what is happening. So um, is the button A1, for example, pressed or not? One interesting thing is, as you speak, isn't quite old standard and wasn't designed with the web in mind, there is not really like an event handler mechanism. So this thing like waiting for data, waiting for a data event, doesn't exist in the USB termino uh, terminology. Um, we kind of like need to build our own event emitting mechanism by issuing a simple read loop. So what we need to do if we want to read data from USB devices 
we constantly need to poll. We constantly need to ask the device for, is there new data? Is there new data? Is there new data? Is there new data? And in order to do that, we do like this simple read loop, like a recursive function, or a wild true loop that we just break if there's an error or such. And every time we have data from the device, so I'm reading 64 bytes here from endpoint number five, then we put the data and emit it via the buffer and maybe have something checking in between if it's the same data as last time because as we're reading the same byte, as we're reading from the device and from the device and from the device, it can be that we're all the time reading the same data and then later on um, it might take us, I don't know, 500,000, a couple of thousands read cycles until there's new data. So yeah. If we wouldn't do that, we would only like get data once at one point in time. If we only use transfer in, we get 64 bytes and we stuck with it until we call the method the next time. Right, uh, it's, it's getting close to the end. So this is unfortunately the, like one of the demos where I actually had three devices working together, but I forgot <coughs> like a cable for one. So what I actually wanted to build in the first place was like a public library checkout system, like something that can handle RFID cards for identification. So this is the part that's not going to work today, unfortunately. Um, but also, I, I, would, I would so love to have one of these as a kid, like our, um, barcode readers, like this, the stuff you have uh, at supermarkets and so on, and uh, a recipe printer. That was definitely built before WebUSB was invented. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, there's the camera, so let's just quickly connect those. That is, okay, that's this one. Great. And so many cables, so much confusion. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, luckily, this device, probably by a Russian vendor, <laughs> is really tough. So yeah, let's take the last USB connector in for today. How often does you miss plug? Pardon? How often do you plug in the wrong way? Uh, you, know, try once, try <laughs> you know, you know, USB has like three states. Yeah, yeah. It's like the first, the second and the third. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. All the time. <laughs> so yeah, um, I also brought some books with me. That's like one of my awesome favorites, JavaScript, the JavaScript, the definite guide. Ooh. Which edition? Fourth edition. It Ooh. covers JavaScript 1.5 from the year 2001. So one of my most pricely possessions. Probably nearly 90% of the stuff isn't accurate anymore. Um, so initially, I would say I, I'd use an RFID card to identify the user. I'm just going to have to mock that now. Um, then I'll scan the books with the barcode scanner. And the cool thing about the barcodes on books is they um, encode the ISBN 13 number of the books. So what I then can do is like read out the ISB number, ISBN number from that barcode ask a web API about what kind of book is this. And later on, if I want to, like, I don't know, land that book from the library, I can print myself a receipt with, like, the return dates or something like that. Well, then, <coughs> let's, just, let's just do that. Uh, 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 yeah, lovely displays. Last time, last time, second to last time um, today. And... I think that, that'll work. So sad, I don't have the RFID cards for identification with me, but things I've learned at working at Deutsche Telekom always implement backdoors. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was never, never implement backdoors. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so I just identified myself by the console. Um, and, oh. Uh, Scan the book. Yeah, here we go. JavaScript, definitely. Another one I, I 
really recommend, I really dig back at the time it was written. I think it was the last book that was written by John Resig, Mentor of Jaggery. That response is faster than most of the big bookstores are <laughs> on their computers. JavaScript, all the things, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there are really two books. The, the cool thing is, like, with the web API, I can get more details. And I said the ISBN is encoded in the barcode. So I just, just get it from reading out the thing. Um, let's connect the printer and print a receipt. Yeah. So I always break those things. But uh, yeah, that was, that was just me because I'm really bad at working with printers and having the paper. But you see, it's like those books, the ISBNs, and the current date, hopefully. Yeah, sorry, just hard to see. But it's like really stuff <laughs> from the browser that's printed on here. I could like, print it all over. I think that one is maybe a, be a bit better to read. So. Yeah, you can see those are the books and the current date. And all you need to know. <laughs> well, that was the last demo, and I'd say three and a half out of four. Not bad today, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I've had worse, <laughs> believe me. Okay, last time, we're, we're, we're really at like the final leg of this talk. Um, I was very surprised when I got this printer and connected it via web USB how easy it was because all I need to do was like connect and configure to do the device like we've seen in the beginning like connect to the device endpoint, connect to the configure interface node, blah blah blah. But then to print data all I need to had to do was like give it a string, encode it with JavaScript text encoder without any further arguments and do a transfer out with that, with that encoded string, and it basically prints everything I just throw at it. That is because that device adheres to the POS print standard of USB, and the system exactly knows what to do when I, when I throw it like a string at it. The other devices, like this barcode scanner, they are a bit more harder to integrate, and interesting devices because they belong to a special group of USB devices, HID, Human Interface Devices. Um, things like keyboards, mice, and touchpads, etc. they belong to this group as well. As many as uh, a lot of older devices, like this Pro very old barcode scanner, that the device manufacturer thought, okay, what is the easiest way for this thing to integrate into maybe even very old systems, if I plug it in, it acts like a keyboard. So <laughs> in the future, hopefully, there will be the HID API alongside the WebUSB API. So Google is actively working on that for about a year. And since for about a year, I I'm waiting to have it. So then you can interact with those devices as well. But Hey, Sebastian, you just did interact with the device. Yeah, with pure old JavaScript event handler magic, as this thing acts as a keyboard and transmits the numbers in sequence, I can detect it and just like use use it with an onkey generic onkey press handler and just grab all the input it sends. Never do this in production. I only know one person who has this in production? It isn't me, it is someone who really knows what he's doing, uh, but never do that. Please just wait for the proper API instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it works. And the interesting thing is, like, this RFID <coughs> reader acts exactly the same. It is just a keyboard, and each of these this cards is ha has um, a special identification number. So if I put the card on this one, it just transmits one identification number from that card like it was a keyboard. So it's actually quite easy to integrate. And it hits enter at the end. Pardon? It hits enter at the end. It hits enter at the end, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is really interesting. It's like, it's, it's not that bad of the thing. Like, well, I'm really sweating right now. <laughs> if you want to start well, sweating, you can start integrating <laughs> USB devices yourself. Chrome has a few helpers for you, like the device lock feature. It's the same like 
if you just go to your URL bar hit Chrome dash dash device lock, and you end with the device lock that Chrome has about all your HID, USB, Bluetooth devices, etc., that you have connected, like with real time events when you connect things and so on. Am I the only one that that is worried about Chrome having a statement? No. <coughs> There's also the USB internals, which is great for testing and tinkering. If you don't have USB devices, you want to break line, uh, have, have them lying around, because you can mock devices. So you can just dream up some devices by adding fields, or filling out the fields under USB internals and interact with your virtual devices that you created. And as I said, unfortunately, the API is only available in Chrome. But while rather cool, it's also available on Chrome on Android. So for Android, you often see devices that have like these adapters that you can plug USB devices onto your tablets directly. And you can interact with them with Web USB on Android devices as well. So Web USB on Chrome runs on Android. Other vendors will maybe maybe they'll pick up. So definitely Microsoft will because Edge changed their JavaScript engine. <laughs> Firefox has a few. So I've talked to people from the Firefox engineering team, and they have a few security concerns about this API. But they're <laughs> investigating into it. They have the same concerns with the Web Bluetooth API, and this will end pretty soonish in Firefox. And Safari, well, <laughs> never are well. <laughs> maybe in five years' time or so, <laughs> let's say. Because nobody knows, right? Um, interesting thing, there's also a web USB library for Node.js, which just presents the web USB interface in Node to us. So what we do is, if we, if we write a, U a driver for a device with web USB, we can not only use it in the browser, we can also, also use it in Node.js. So what this gives us is basically like, a platform independent USB driver system. We can use it in the back end, in the front end, basically everywhere where JavaScript is running and has some kind of USB capability or serial port connectability in the back. Takeaways. So we're really at the last leg now. So Web USB lets us write our own drivers for devices because, to be honest, there are not many devices out there you can buy that bring a web USB compatible driver on a website. Um, but if you look at GitHub, there are many people who reverse engineer a lot of devices that are out there. So there's a lot of stuff on NPM and GitHub you can just like use and reuse for devices which are similar to the ones others reverse engineered. You can use it for interesting things like a plug and play system, like a checkout system for shops similar to the one I have with my little library example, because there are EN databases for all the goods out there on the web. You can use them and just build an instant checkout system for a shop, even with just like an Android tablet. You don't even need a PC for that. Just use an Android tablet, attach like two or three USB device, have a receipt printer, and you're gone. You have a checkout system ready to go. Yeah, and, and even better, you don't need to uh, write an app and deploy it and update it. You just have a PWA and that's it. Exactly, because WebUSB also works in PWA environments. So even if your tablet is offline, well, you can't use the Web API then to query for EN things. But if you have just a local subset of things, it works without internet connection as well, because it works within a PWA. And one of the things I think that is wonderful with it is like it makes it easy to start to tinker with hardware. Because when I was a mentor at the Coda Dojo in Cologne, we often had kids that did walk up with no computer, but with an Android tablet. And we always had to, like, organize, had to organize computers for them at the Coda Dojo so that they can start tinker if they want to tinker with hardware. And now all they need is like really cheap, I mean, you can get Android tablets for about 30 or 40 bucks now. They're not really good, but they're good enough to get started. Especially if you have like, kids in the Code Dojo, maybe not from the wealthiest families, like we can, we can easily gather, like have some sponsors and, and get devices like these tablets for 30 or 40 bucks, like a handful of them, and hand them out to the kids. And not only that, but then they can not only make websites and stuff, but also interact with real hardware. 
which is like a great thing. And even if you're not a kid, working with hardware can be intimidating. And if you eliminate all the hard setup steps, then you, you open up this whole system for a brand new wave of tinkerers, which will bring more creativity to the whole well, ecosystem of do-it-yourself electronics, which is a wonderful thing. And yeah, uh, I really hate the term isomorphic JS, so I had to put it up there. Um, as I said, we can write drivers that work in browsers and backend systems. We can write drivers that are code-wise exactly the same, work in a browser and a node. And well, whatever we do, we can start improving the lives of the end user with this new technology. And we can do the most fun things, like have lots of fun and build very shitty robots. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Thank you for bearing with me and thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions, ask it go on Twitter. Ask it go .com is for web page with emails if you don't use Twitter, etc. Or I'll be around for now. It's time for a beer or oh, cork thing. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>